Let's pick up where we were on the second derivative test videos. I believe this is where we were in trying to find our critical points. We've made that trig substitution for the sine of a double angle because we need all of our angles to be the same measure. It's going to help us find where this equals zero. Notice I have two like terms here. So I'm going to factor out I'm going to factor out a 2 cosine x from each one of these terms. That's going to leave me 1. And if I factor out a 2, that leaves me 2. And if I factor out the cosine, that leaves me sine of x. So this is the easiest way to find our zeros. If we have any two things multiplied together, they can only have a product of 0 when 1 equals 0 or the other equals zero. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find the angle measures where that factor equals zero and the angle measures where that factor equals zero. Well, we're going to divide both sides by two. That leaves us cosine of x. Cosine equals zero when the angle measures on the interval from zero to two pi, just one full revolution, cosine equals zero when the angle measures are pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. So there are two critical points for this function. Over here, let's subtract 1 from both sides. Let's divide both sides by negative 2. So for what angle measures is the sine function a positive 1 half? Well, let's go in quadrant 1, we have shorter y values than we do x values. That's where we're going to have root 3 over 2 and 1 half. That's where the sine value is going to be shorter. And that happens at that smaller angle measure. So that's definitely happening at pi over 6. And in one full revolution, it happens over here as well. And this is 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, and that is 5 pi over 6. See how handy the unit circle is? So we have four critical values, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, pi over 6, and 5 pi over 6. So I need to find the second derivative and evaluate it at each of those four critical points. That's what it's going to take for me to find the extrema using the second derivative test. So I'm going to go back here. That's probably going to be the easiest place for me to find my second derivative. I'll do it in a different color so things don't kind of get all mixed up there. Give myself some room. f double prime of x equals, my 2 pops out front, the derivative of positive cosine of x is negative sine of x minus 4. Now I have a product. I'm going to have 1 d2 plus 2 d1. And look here, that's a negative 4. So that negative is going to distribute over here and affect that positive sign. So I have factored my 4 out front. So here's 1 and here's 2. So 1 d2 plus 2 d1. That's where we are there. So let's clean this up a little bit. Negative 2 sine of x plus 4 sine squared of x minus 4 cosine squared of x. And now there's my second derivative function, and I need that second derivative at each of these four critical values. I don't know if I'm going to run out of room here or not. We'll try to get it done. So remember, all we have to do is plug in these critical points and determine the sign of the second derivative. That's the process that we're applying right now. So I've given us some more room here. We're going to plug these critical points into the second derivative and try to determine the sign, S-I-G-N sign, that we will get out of these mathematical operations. So I'm just going to write all of them down. 
we are looking for the sign of the second derivative at all of our critical points. This would be one of those questions where it would be really important that we knew our trig exact values and finally we'll see what the second derivative is doing at 5 pi over 6. So let's see, the sine of pi over 2 is 1. That goes in those two blanks. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Negative 2 plus 4, this is a negative 2 plus 4 is a positive value, and then minus 0 is still positive. At 3 pi over 2, sine is negative 1 and cosine is 0. So this is a positive 2, but negative 1 squared makes this a positive 4. So there is another positive value still going on there. At pi over 6, sine is a positive 1 half, and cosine is a positive square roots of 3 over 2. This first term is negative 1. The second term is 4 times 1 fourth, so that's a positive 1. So those cancel. This is a negative value times what is going to be a positive value, so that's negative. At 5 pi over 6, sine is still positive 1 half and cosine is a negative root 3 over 2. So just as happened at pi over 6, those two terms, negative 1 plus 1 are 0. This is still going to be a negative term, however, because that negative value for cosine is squared. So remember, when your second derivative is positive, your function is concave up. The second derivative test tells you you're going to have a minimum there. When your second derivative is negative, your function is concave down. The second derivative tells you your function is going to have a maximum there. So this function on the interval in question has two maximums and two minimums. Now let's kind of tie everything together. This is not necessarily the first or second derivative test, but I want us to begin to look, and this is what the next lesson is over, I want us to begin to look at what the first derivative tells us about the function, what the second derivative tells us about the first derivative and the function. This is really important that you understand these relationships. And the next couple of lessons specifically talk about these relationships. Inflection points are where concavity does change. Remember the difference between a critical point, which is anywhere that the first derivative equals zero or is undefined, regardless of whether monotonicity changes. An inflection point, a potential inflection point, is where that second derivative equals zero or is undefined, but it's not an actual inflection point unless the second derivative changes sign, which means that the function changed concavity. And that occurs at the critical numbers of f double prime, or where f double prime equals zero or is undefined. If the first derivative is positive, the function increases. If the first derivative is negative, the function decreases. If the second derivative is positive, it tells us 
The second derivative tells us things uh, about the first derivative that the first derivative tells us about the original function because those relationships are the same. What the first derivative tells us about the original function, the second derivative tells us about the first derivative function because that's the same relationship. So when the second derivative is positive, the first derivative is increasing. And when the second derivative is negative, the first derivative decreases. When the second derivative is positive, the function's concave up. Second derivative negative, function concave down. The second derivative gives the same information about the first derivative that the first derivative gives about the original function. For f of x to increase, f prime has to be positive. For f prime to increase, f double prime has to be positive. For f to decrease, f prime has to be negative. And for f prime to decrease, f double prime has to be negative. Make sure you understand these relationships. Again, the next couple of lessons cover this in minutia because you need to be able to talk about these relationships and discern information about your function and first derivative and second derivative functions based on these relationships and on this information right here. It's the relationship between f, f prime and f double prime. We need to do it analytically. We need to be able to talk about it verbally. We need to be able to do it graphically. This is a really big concept that's on the AP exam. So make sure you understand that.